Hello and welcome to Life with God, a podcast where we explore key ideas in God through conversations with students and expert guests. As humans created in the image of God, we are called to reflect His character. But so many influences around us can leave us confused, broken, hurtful, and just longing for more. In Life with God, we seek to understand better the interdependent concepts of love, presence, power, beauty, freedom, justice, and truth by focusing on one concept at a time so that we learn healthy patterns of thought and behavior. We engage in this journey reflectively as followers of God who believe that a life with God is the best life we can live. We seek a relationship with God and, as we delve into this complex, unique, and fulfilling relationship, we invite you to come alongside and learn with us. Each season is a journey through 12 episodes. We first look at the concept from a combination of historical, psychological, philosophical, scientific, and artistic perspectives. Then we delve into the Bible with six episodes focused on the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the entirety of Scripture. The season concludes with three episodes helping us grasp the implications of the concept in key relational contexts – family, community, and leadership. We hope that our discoveries will make us better human beings. And whether you are a Christian or not, we hope that you will join us in this space of conversation where you may find valuable insights to improve your self-image, your relationships, and most importantly, your understanding of the divine. In season three, we study the concept of power in God. And our special guest in episode 12 is Stanley Patterson, Professor Emeritus of Leadership in the Department of Practical and Applied Theology at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, Michigan. We are also joined by Bianca Rinko, Rainer Suarez, Ingrid Dumitrescu, and Eric Appler. I am your host, Adelina, and as always, I'm very grateful for this conversation. Before we go into the discussion, we will take five minutes to get to know our guest through a speed round of questions. How would you describe your personality in a few words? I tend to be a good communicator. Sometimes I communicate longer than I should. Uh, so that takes that takes wisdom to know how to balance uh, speaking and listening. For instance, that's something I, I have continued to work on. Uh, my personality, I tend to 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 be uh, an introvert in terms of my approach. Some people have a hard time accepting my introversion. Um, because I, uh, because of the fact that I'm a good communicator, but I, I gain my energy from solitude. Uh, you know, I, 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 the, the COVID experience has pushed me into, into solitude that was extended by the fact that I retired, uh, in, in 2020. And one of the, one of the interesting things that I've discovered about myself in that process in terms of personality and style is that in in all the time that has passed since 2020 began, I have never got tired of being alone. Now that sounds strange, but uh, the solitude is 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 a source of of, of stress reduction for me, and uh, it gives me time to think about about the issues that I, I deal with in life. Um, I play the role of the firstborn in our family. There were five boys born. Uh, two two were born that didn't survive. That would have been seven. But uh, my oldest brother never never seemed to care about being in charge. He was sometimes domineering. But 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 uh, it's kind of like the the firstborn responsibility was passed to me when I was fairly young. Mm-hmm. If you could time travel, to which point in history would you like to travel? 
I think the period of the Enlightenment, you know, we as Adventists tend to shy away from some of these in, in, Enlightenment authors and, and what have you. But in, in the last 20 years, I've traveled to probably 50 or 60 different countries, different cultures and, and, and what have you that go with that. And the countries that experience the pain of Enlightenment, are the most interesting countries and I believe the most successful countries today. Germany had went through uh, enlightenment contributed to that process. My native uh, country is Scotland. The Scots went through, through the English went through it. So there's, there's a, the, that period of the enlightenment that led to the revolution that made America what it is today. And our constitution is fed out of that period of enlightenment. There's some real problems that, that go with it, uh, but the thinking that was done in the enlightenment and how it impacts our life today uh, is profound. What is the most daring thing you have done? The most daring thing? Oh my. I, mean, I gotta make sure I don't reveal something that needs to be, needs to be kept secret. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I bought an airplane with my brother. Neither one of us knew how to fly, but we bought an airplane. And we found somebody to teach us how to fly it. So we, we learned to fly in our own plane. And, and usually you learn to fly and then you buy a plane. But, uh, but we, he, he and I learned to fly and got our pilot's license in, uh, in, uh, in our own plane. So that, that was, I don't know, maybe a little bit daring. But I also learned that daring in, in the context of flying an airplane, being daring is not a positive thing. You do that if you're alone in the cockpit. But uh, making sure that the people you're carrying and even yourself is, is safe is, is more important than being daring. But I do believe in, in, in pressing the limits in terms of thinking, in terms of, of, of teaching, in terms of relationships between leaders and followers. Uh, so that has gotten me into trouble at times because I, I'm fairly straight, I'm fairly plain spoken when it comes to issues of, of integrity. And I, 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 we'll, we'll touch on something later in our conversation that, uh, that will illustrate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, our time is up, actually. It's amazing how fast five minutes go by, and we really do, do enjoy learning about you. Um, I'm going to make an exception today, and uh, we'll spend a, a few more minutes uh, for Reiner and Bianca's questions, and then we'll begin our conversation. So Reiner, go ahead. Mm -hmm. A piece of advice that you received and has never forgotten. Advice that I received and never forgotten. I have a mentor who's been a blessing to my life. And I, and I was in the, in the midst of a conflict with, with another person in our, in, our, in our organization. He and I worked, both worked for the same conference. And I was unloading on him, unloading my anger, you know, and, and my, my intentions and what have you. And he stopped me in the middle of that, of that rant and said, uh, what I hear from you makes me believe that you're, 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 you're worse off than the person that you're angry at. So here my, my mentor that's supposed to be helping me grow and, and what have you risks hurting my feelings by simply telling me the truth about my behavior. And I will never forget that night standing in the hallway in South Southern Adventist University uh, administration building, having him tell me that, that I am demonstrating behavior that's, that, that exceeds anything that, that he knows about the person I had conflict with. And, and that helped me, to, that, that helped me to look, look at myself first in regard to conflict and, and, and issues and anger and, and th those things need to be managed carefully. 
Um, I think that's why the fruit of the spirit is so important is that those are the relational qualities that make us the kind of men and women that God wants us to be. Amen. Besides Jesus, who is that biblical person from whom you learned the most about soul saving? Well, I'm working on a book right now. And it's entitled the, the Conversations from the Streets of Gold. And so I, I'm building the, the chapters of the book around people I want to talk to when, it, when, I, when I get to the Holy City. Oh. And one of the people that, that that's, is a standout for me is Barnabas. Hmm. Um, there, there are too few people in positional leadership that value the kind of, uh, you know, Barnabas is the, the encourager. And there are not enough of those kind of people in positions of leadership who would give a John Mark another, another chance to demonstrate his value. Paul was ready to throw John Mark overboard. Barnabas says no. In fact, it, 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 they separated the team. Barnabas and Paul separated in, in order for Barnabas to mentor and to develop the value he saw in John Mark. So I would say one of the people I want to talk to is, is, and be, be like is, is Barnabas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this is just a speed run of questions and we're already learning uh, important things about leadership and interpersonal relationships. And I appreciate your openness to share uh, from your personal experience. Um, Dr. Patterson, this is the final episode in season three, God is Power. And uh, we like to focus here on leadership. And I'm really excited about bringing your experience in leadership, uh, leadership into this conversation. My opening question is, um, from your research and understanding of the Bible, um, how does the scripture portray the use of power in leadership? Uh, positive and negative examples okay. you can share. Uh, I think when we deal with that question, uh, Adelina, uh, we have to go back to the time before sin was a reality. Okay. And, and so I would, I would encourage you to go back and look at those moments that, that give us leadership, leadership uh, uh, training that, that, that happened before sin was, was a reality in our lives. And I'm going to just take Genesis 1. In verse 26 of Genesis 1, Somebody comes into the planning room and says, let's make, let's make man in our image. Let's make them like us. It does not reveal who us is. We do not know who the person was who made the suggestion, but it's a, it is the most, most powerful suggestion that I can imagine, that, that God would share who he is, even the power that is his is shared in that context. And so you have you have a team of three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are dealing with these enormous responsibility of, of designing this world and human beings. Um, and, and he does it totally contrary to what we see after sin. God shares power and authority prior to sin. He shares it freely. I mean, Adam and Eve, I mean, Adam, excuse me, the very first thing that God did after he created him was say, go name the animals. And whatever you decide to call them, that's, that will be their name. So here is a good moment to, 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 to express that. Giving Adam the responsibility is simple delegation. But giving Adam the responsibility with the authority to have the final say is power coupled with authority, which is the healthiest model. Yeah. If you have power, you need also to have authority so you know what, what are the boundaries that go with that. Did I answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, in a very... 
I would say, um, concise ways that open up a lot of different dis uh, yeah, points of discussion here. Um, maybe just to go a bit further at this point, you couple here power and authority, and you said that this is the healthiest model. Um, what about a counterfeit model? What would that look like in, in conceptually and maybe with an example? Okay, like, ask uh, a question. Yeah, so uh, if this is a healthy model, what would okay. an unhealthy model look like? Okay, and, right. and yeah, we, we, we have an unhealthy model the transition between pre sin and post sin, and that unhealthy model is found in the thoughts of Lucifer, recorded in Isaiah 14. And Lucifer, Lucifer decides that he is going to go to a position that is higher than what he already has. And so he, he says in his heart, I will rise above. Mm -hmm. And in, in Isaiah 14, you got the five I will. I will rise above. But in, in Ezekiel 28, which is, a, which is a mirror or partner chapter with Isaiah 14, God says to, to Lucifer, I established you. So Lucifer is moving up in, in, in his intent. He, he, he's, he, I call it self-ascendancy. He, he, he's putting himself above when God has never called him to be above. So he, he leaves the context of God's authority, giving him authority for, for whatever it was that he did as, as, a, as a, the, the cherub. And so that transition from, from no sin to sin starts in the heart of a person who does not have the authority to make the decision that they made, but they made those decisions anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the that's unhealthy, un, unhealthy leadership. Um, so, but in this case, in this particular case that we're talking about Lucifer, he had the power to make those shows those decisions right well explain what you mean by the power um i, I mean free will like you, you said before that the correct model combines power and authority is that correct yeah. in, a, yeah. in a balanced manner so we have here lucifer lucifer has the power to go beyond his authority the that, that he has well, given I, I, would, I would challenge you a little bit uh on that Rainer. lucifer lucifer's goal was to usurp the throne of the second person of the godhead or at least in a more general term god so he, he's wanting to place himself on god's throne he's very clear in that in, the, in those five by wills one of them says says I will sit on my throne on the, on the furthest side, further side of the north, on the mountain of the Lord. And 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 so, did he ever achieve that that universal dominance? See, if he did not achieve it, which he didn't, he never got to sit on the throne of God. That says that he wanted it, but he did not have the power to make it happen. The power is the ability to do something. He did not have the ability to accomplish his goal. And he was defeated as a result. Am I making sense on that? Yes. And it's making me think about Pilate when he was confronting G Jesus in the court, that there was uh, a authority power kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And when Pilate says to Jesus, you know, I, I can I can get you free or I can get you killed if I want. And uh, how do you see in that example um, a model for a counterfeit um, model of power authority? Well, anytime, anytime that, that we use power to dominate some other person. So here, here's Pilate standing, standing with Jesus, saying to him that I have the I have the power to give you life, or I have the power to take your life. 
But the one who really had the power was Jesus because he's the one that decided whether he lived or whether he died. And so Jesus, Jesus took the path that led to the cross because of his ability to choose that direction in his life. The only power that, that Pilate had was the temporal pow uh, power uh, offered by the Roman Empire in his position. That's it. That's it. And, and 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 that was that was a lot of power, but it was not absolute power because because Jesus is the one that decided what was going to happen. It's interesting how you mentioned that um, power is also it is uh, something that talks to me is that to in order to not abuse power you have to sort of know your place, know your place. For me, uh, I used to have, have trouble with authority. I would question them and especially point out if they wouldn't live up to their role model. However, you also talked about the Enlightenment, how, you, how, you, how it fascinated you, what the Enlightenment period did to the society of European countries, for example. Um, and something like these European, uh, those, those carriers of the Enlightenment did was actually stand up to the power they actually didn't acknowledge their place in society. They uh, lived a heretic life against the, the, the back then, the, the power order that was existing in Europe. So how can we uh, sort of find out what is our place in the world when it comes to the level of power and authority that we have as a person in society and in front of God? Good, good question, Eric. Um... All of us have limits, and we have to find out what those limits are. When, the, when Russia posted troops on the border of Ukraine back in early 2022, I thought it would be a very quick war because I assumed in my mind that, is, that, that Russia was much more powerful. As it turned out, Russia did not have the power that they thought they had. So, so, so the, the knowing what your limits are based on, your, on, on the definition of your position, very important. Let me just give you one, one other, one other uh, situation. I have... I'm a, I'm a professor emeritus at this point, but if I go down to Southern Adventist University and say, I'm professor emeritus, and I, I demand a temporary office, do they have to give it to me? Do I have any, I mean, policy says here at Andrews that I, I should be able to ask my department for a temporary office and I would get it. Does my authority extend to another educational institution? No, no. So I have to remember that I'm a professor at Andrews. I'm not a professor at Southern, I'm just a human being. And the only way I, I would, would, would gain that respect at Southern would be if, if my reputation preceded me to the degree that I was trusted with, with those kind of, 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 of privileges. Um, so yeah, we do need to know, and, and Lucifer went beyond his authority. I believe that the attack on Ukraine was, was Russia was going beyond its authority. And so we just have to understand that we got an, it is very important that we understand what power do we have and, and in terms of authority, do we have permission to exercise that power? That's a critical, critical distinction in positional leadership. Well, this actually makes me wonder um, in reference to conflict because yeah, conflict arises um, between maybe a person and institution or maybe between two countries or so on and so forth, between two entities because they presume they have uh, some, yeah, some authority there, 
or or maybe a person can perceive an institutional power to be wrong in some way, um, yeah, to be oppressive in some way. So what is a reference point for us as Christians, I guess? I, I don't know if I can ask for everyone because people have different value systems, people different worldviews, but for us as Christians, how do we negotiate those kind of conflicts uh, that we may experience um, in the sense of different functioning in a, in a system that has different definitions of power and authority? What is a reference point? Um, it's, a very, it's a very dangerous thing to try to determine who has power and who doesn't. It's something you kind of do on your own without making making much of a, of a stir about that. Um, but the the institutions have a tendency to move. Uh, let me just name a, a great book in this regard. It's not it's not a Christian book, but the book. Uh, uh, The book um, Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's a strange, strange name. It won a Pulitzer Prize back in, in, in about the year 2000. And it, what it's, it says there's, there's a model that organizations follow. When they start out, they're relational. The followers know their leaders. And there's a relational connection between, between the people in the group. As time goes on, uh, Diamond is the last name of this person, this author. As time goes on, they eventually move to, to stage stage four leadership that he refers to as a kleptocracy. So you go from the you go from the highly relational, where people know their leaders, you move to a a, a, a type of governance where the leaders don't know the followers. And the leaders are the ones who, 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 who spend much of the resources of the group, where the people don't have much say in how that's, how that's done. And I'm going to be honest with you, I fear that that behavior is impacting our church. The fastest growing consumer of resources in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the General Conference. They actually grew in terms of, of their, their spending. At what point does that become that, that reveal a, a kleptocracy? I'm not asking you to answer that. I just want you to think about it. Because, because as church members, we are responsible. This is a representative system. And if we don't understand these processes, we can never identify the illness that's coming into our organization. Let me give you another example. The November issue of Adventist World had three articles by our, our general conference president. And the three articles you had, you know what a byline is? It says Ted N. C. Wilson is president. Da, 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 da. There were three different bylines used in the same issue of Adventist World. Within about four or five months, they, they settled on new titles for everybody at the general conference. Now I'm not anti-organization, okay, but I'm I'm going to, I'm being honest with you here. The new title given to leaders at the general conference was Ted N. C. Wilson, president of the World Church of Seventh Day Adventists. When he was elected, his title was Ted N. C. Wilson. President of the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists, which re reveals the greatest expression of scope of leadership. What about the, 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 the span of exercising power is, is highest in which of the titles? World. World. So in, in embracing, embracing a title that makes, makes him president of the whole world the whole world church moves him from a limited a limited position to an unlimited position. Does that make sense? And I, I'm, I'm not sharing this to be, to, be, to be hurtful to anyone, 
But if we don't understand, if we don't understand the parameters of authority, this happens in, in all organizations tend to move toward consolidating power in the few or in one. I mean, uh, Putin has consolidated all the power of Russia into one person, him. That is what never would you say, been, oh, sorry. That, that has never been God's design for the church ever. No, ever, not ever. Go ahead. What would you say are the parameters of, uh, of, of authority? Well, we have, we have working policies in the organization that define each position and, and the, 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 the scope. I'm using that, that term because that is, the, that is, that is the, the span of authority. What, what, how much space does it take in? And so, so you have you have the working policies. The, 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 the problem with working policies is it, is it, it has the opportunity. They have, we we have the opportunity to change it every year at, at annual council. So what was intended in 1901 in terms of the standard and, and the scope of authority in the church by by 2022 it has changed. I received an email this week from a from a president of a union in Africa, and he's in he's in he's in a conflict with his division, because his division told told him to have a constituency session after the general conference committee meet or general conference uh, general conference. What 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 the, the Session? The big meeting, huh? Yeah, the session. I don't know. Session. <laughs> session. Yes, the session. The general conference session. And so, so the parameters can be changed in policy. So what you have to do, you have to go back and find where did the parameters, what were the parameters when this was invented in the first place? And that's 1901, general conference session of 1901. But if you don't know that, you don't know where. Where the fence posts are that define the boundaries. Most of you who are still in your process of education stuff, you have fairly narrow authority base. You have authority in your family. You have a fairly narrow authority base. Uh, I got fired from my first conference after seven years, not because I was not a good pastor or performer, but because I kept criticizing leadership behavior. And so I did not, I was not a careful steward of the scope of my, of my ministry because I kept going out of my boundaries to criticize people that were above me. They kept me as long as they could because I was a producer, but finally I became too much of a pain and they fired me. By God's grace, I got back in and everything got straightened out, not in that conference, but the funny thing is 30 years later, I was invited to come do a consulting gig for that same conference to help them establish uh, their, their leadership model. Mm -hmm. So that's weird you know, for that to happen after all those years. But and what I said, does it make sense what I'm saying? You have to find the original context in which that policy was made. And 1901 was when we, we elected, when we, we selected as a people, a representative system. So the people hold the authority in the church, not the leaders. The leaders only have authority for a certain length of time. And the constituency session, they they come to session with their authority diminished. And it has to be reinstated if they're going to continue to lead. Okay. But the representative system is under attack, maybe not intentionally, but it's under attack today. Dr. Patterson, uh, I'd like yes. to shift just a little bit and ask you, um, as human beings, we often misinterpret stories of the Bible or we only see what we want to see. Um, how do you see Jesus's use of his power? Is it balanced or does he ever use it in a destructive way? Well, he confused a lot of people 
regarding his power. John, John 14. I think it was Philip that asked him the question. Uh, no, that the request. Show us the Father, and that will suffice. In other words, show us the Father, and we'll, we'll, we won't we won't bother you about this anymore. And and Jesus be, became a little bit a little bit irate. But his 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 rebuke to Philip was, was relatively mild. I think I, I think of my mother. My mother, if, if I had gone as far as the disciples did with Jesus, my mother would have thumped me. You know, but Jesus didn't thump him. Um, so Jesus tells him. Jesus tells him that he does not have the authority. He does not have the authority. It is, it is only the, the, the power of God that gives him the ability to, to make those things happen. Another one is, is in John 20, in John 20, or uh, Matthew 20, I'm sorry. Matthew 20, where, where James and John tell their mother to ask Jesus to, to reserve the right seat and the left seat beside him on his throne so that they can be rulers with him, James and John. And so, so Jesus asked James and John, can you do this? Now, here, here, this is the question of power. Can you do this? James and John both said, no problem. No problemo. <laughs> Did they know what they were saying no problemo about? They did not really understand that. And so in the long run, oh, Jesus says to him, he says, can you drink the cup that I drink? And can you eat the, the bread that I, that I, that I take? Um, and they said, yes, I could do that. But then, then Jesus adds at the end, he says, okay, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you what you asked for. But understand that I don't have the authority. It is the Father who has authority to decide who sits by me on the right and on the left. So now James and John end up with, with, with the cup that is suffering and death, which is the burial. They end up with the suffering and death in, 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 instead of what they had originally had asked for, but no authority. So Jesus was very careful about, about expressing his limit of authority because during his time on this earth, he, he, he functioned on the basis of borrowed authority from the Father. He says, the Father does in me the works that I do. And so, so again, again, this is an example of, of poor stewardship of authority or power, I'm sorry. But James and John were trying to gain authority from Jesus for something that he didn't have the authority to give. Now, now the, 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 I said earlier that that uh, that is confusing because when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory with all of his angels with him to to resurrect the dead, does he come back without authority, or does he come with authority? With authority, he comes with authority. So his glorification in heaven after the crucifixion and the ascension of Jesus back to heaven, he was he, he was given all of his of his divine authority back to him. So when he comes back the, the next time, he does not come back, he does not come back as, as a person without authority. Yes, and what came to my mind as well is actually the Great Commission in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, uh, verse 18. Uh, where Jesus says that all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and instruct all the nations, immersing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to, to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. And, <laughs> and uh, my question would be uh, regarding that, that, um, so in this passage, we can see that, that Jesus would like to give us um, what's his. So he would like to, to use us as instruments in his hands. Let, and, let me go ahead. Yes, and just what, what uh, do you think that, um, what is the, 
the key to effective soul saving work. Okay, let me give you a mental model that you can play with. Jesus has a golden platter. Like some people at Thanksgiving time, I put a turkey on it, big, 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 big steel, <laughs> or silver or gold platter. And on the gold platter, he has heaped up authority. He's holding this platter with just a, a ton of authority on this platter. And he says, go ye, I don't know if you know Greek or not, but hina, therefore, because of. Go because of this. So he gives them authority. He says, take all you want. Because there's more from more where that came from. So you have unlimited authority to do what? We are given the authority to do things in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So my, my permission to use God's name. If I'm not his child and I'm not following him, I'm using his name in vain if I, if I call out for something to happen in his name. If I'm his child and I am commissioned in the church, I don't mean a position, I'm talking about commissioned as a person. The power that is available to you to do is amazing. But what's more importantly is, is that Jesus gives us Permission. I, I have participated in several uh, commissioning of military officers where, where you have a person that's commissioned into the United States Navy or they're commissioned into the Marine Corps or, or whatever. And they, they do not have the right for, to wear the uniform or claim, claim the, the position on their shoulder or on their wrist. They do not have the right to claim that unless they have been given the authority of that position. And so, so the, the authority that you're talking about, uh, 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 Blanca, the Bianca, 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 Bianca the, the authority that you're talking about is, is a limitless authority to carry out the gospel commission. If your spiritual gift is teaching, if your spiritual gift is healing, whatever your spiritual gift is, you exercise that spiritual gift in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you have permission to do that if you're a child of God. So, so that, that, that is authority that's available to every person and it's not small, it's a huge thing. It is how the church can be successful is for us to recognize that we have unlimited authority when it comes to, to carrying out the mission of the gospel. Yeah, that's quite a fascinating concept. Sorry, Bianca, did you have a follow up? Oh yes, uh, just that uh, the question that um, connected to this, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Patterson, that what is the, the key to effective soul-saving work? To affecting what? Effective soul-saving work. Oh, okay. Number one, work within the context of your gift. Mm -hmm. Work within the context of your gift. Don't claim, don't claim giftedness in areas that you, 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 that you aren't gifted in. So you, you need to know what is it that God has gifted me to do? And it may be multiple things, or it may be one very specific, specific focused thing. But know, know what it is. Number two, love the people you lead. L-O-V-E. Love them to the point that you would die for them. That's the kind of love that... that, 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 that results in transformation and changed lives. Another thing I do, if I'm talking to, to you guys as, as leaders, I would say, from time to time, look over your shoulder, look back and say, look at, look at the people that, that you have led and ask yourself the question, are they better off for having spent time with me or are they worse off? Have I done something to contribute to the transformation of their lives that allows them to be leaders themselves and not just forever being a follower. That's transformational leadership. And we have to take, take a look backwards at time. Are the people that we, that we led, are they more likely to be leaders tomorrow because they had spent time with me? And, and that's, that's, not a, that's not a prideful bit of assessment. That's a very important assessment. 
But when, when I was called into ministry, I was a carpenter. Actually, I owned a construction company. And when I started sensing that God had called me into ministry, I, I thought, I thought this can't be from God. God would not want someone like me. I was rough. I was rude. I was just a lot of things that I shouldn't have been. But he did call me. He did call me. And, and, and in one year, for instance, in a three, a three district church, three, yeah, three church district, I had the privilege of working with, with, with active, committed lay people to the point that we baptized in, in an Anglo, in three Anglo churches, small churches. We baptized 87 people in one year. And, and I marveled at the fact that God was able to actually use me. That was about three or four years after I went into ministry. And so, first of all, love the people, work within the context of, of your calling where you have authority to work, and then leave it to God. Don't worry so much about results. Worry about building relationships. You build relationships and people will follow. Thank you so much. And uh, just a short uh, comment that it was so important for me that you pointed out the, the transformational uh, power of God, that uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who, who transforms us and who, who leads our ministry and who, who helps us uh, to, be, to be instruments in God's hands so more and more people could be uh, transformed into, into God's image. See, I, I think that one of the most important leadership contexts in, in, in the church is understanding that within the context of your spiritual gift, you are expected to lead, not follow. And, and we're, we're content being followers, partly because it, it, it's like I, I don't have responsibility, so I can't, they can't blame me, you know. But that's not what it's about. That's not what it is about. And, and, uh, and um, so lead people with love, but also lead them into meaningful contribution. You know, me, meaningful responsibility. Let me put it that way. That everybody in the church, I mean everybody, even if you've got a person that comes to, to work smelling like Jim Beam. You probably don't know Jim Beam. But, I mean, like whiskey, okay? <laughs> even a person who comes to church smelling like whiskey, find something meaningful for, for them to do. Now, they can't be an elder. They can't be many things. But you can find something. I had a I had a drunk that used to come to church, and and I asked him if he, if when Sabbath school was over would he go into the children's rooms and line up the chairs. By Sabbath morning, he was never drunk enough that he couldn't do that. He did a good job, but it gave him something to do. And 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 the the key is make them belong before you baptize them. They should belong to the community before you baptize them, not after. I would have a follow-up question uh, based on Ingrid's and Bianca's last um, direction. Um, maybe something a bit more specific, um, talking about leadership um, and authority and power. What would, could you offer some comments about male-female dynamic in uh, church leadership? Sure. If we judge the fitness of a person based on sex, sexual uh, gender, I mean, not sex, but, but based on gender. Uh, again, I grew up out, out on, on a farm. My, my father was a sharecropper, which means he did not own the land that we, that we, that we farmed. Um, but when it came time to do the harvest, Everybody went to the field. Women, children, men, everybody went to the field. Everybody got involved in chopping the, the grain and, and loading it onto the truck. And everybody was involved. When it came time to fix lunch, because my family was all boys, two of us boys had to go back and work in the kitchen. And we took turns doing that because we thought that was the most most insulting thing in the world. That we 
we would leave the men and go back and work with the women. Okay, that's unfortunate. But the mentality, the mentality limits our ability to function. I was teaching a class, a doctoral class in South Africa. And it had one woman in the class. And each person in the class had to give, give a, an oral report. And each of the men had given their reports. And when it came to the, to the female, I asked her to stand and give her report. The men immediately started talking to each other, would not, would not, would not give her space to, to speak. And I, I had to exercise my authority as a teacher to get them to shut up long enough that this woman who has a, who has a, a, a demon, uh, who, uh, who has a demon, to give her a chance to, to, to function. And so that's a, a hard uphill battle, uh, Adelina. But, but the, best, the best I can do as a man is make sure that I don't perpetrate the, the behavior that has kept women, women from being full partners in ministry. But I'm telling you, some of the gifts are much better occupied by women than men. I was pastoring a church of about 800 at one time, and there was a woman on staff when, 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 I, when I took the position. But I had never worked with another a female pastor. This has been a long time ago now. What I found was that my productivity went up because, because the senior pastor is almost always the one associated with what gets done. But the truth is, what really, what really happened was that woman, she would go places that, that, that men would not go. She, she, was, she was effective uh, in, in many parts of ministry. So to the point that when I left there, I made a commitment that I would never pastor a multi-staff church again without at least woman, one woman on staff. So it, it's a slow process, Alina, but it's a process. I have three daughters, so I have, I have a, a vested interest in this. That uh, that we 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 need to sometimes even insist. For instance, uh, yeah, I I I'm just going to stop there. I I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, it's we, happening we, in we, China we right now. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and I've been there and seen some of these uh, churches that are led by women and well led. Mm -hmm. But uh, for some reason, the society, the society allows for it. Um, the first time I went to Romania, I was there for a month, visited probably 25 or 30 churches back in 1976. And, and I noticed a strong a strong tendency for the Romanian church to use women to do things, but not things of position. Now, I don't know if I, if I read that correctly or not, but- uh, Very correctly. But, but this is very, very true in most of Eastern Europe and, and beyond and beyond. So this is a big problem, the big problem. And, and, and we, we, I mean, look at Matthew nine where, 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 where Jesus says, the harvest is great and the laborers are few. The problem in that statement is not the harvest. You have this enormous harvest that's waiting to be reaped, but the laborers are few. So why would we be so silly as to, as to accept fewer workers if we have a harvest in front of us by, by eliminating women from the, from the opportunity of being part of that process? You kind of have to. See, I, I asked a pastor down in um, uh, American Virgin Islands, I think is where it was, the meeting was. And he became very angry at me when I was teaching because, because of my promotion of, 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 of women in positions of leadership. And I said, Do you really believe that it would be a sin for you as a pastor to? to to put a woman, a woman in, a, in a position of responsibility? He said, yes. That's how deep it goes with some men. He honestly believed that it, that it was a carnal sin to put a man or a woman in responsibility where she was in authority over a man. So just be patient with that process because 
things have changed. Things have changed, but it, it's going to be a long process. So do do the work that you do, but sometimes you you have to exercise courage uh, in order to do it. But uh, you know, let me let me do a real quick overview of definitions because I think it's very important for for you to to be clear on this. Number one. Power is simply being able to do something. Authority is the permission of the community to do it. If you if you exercise if you exercise power without authority, what is that called? Authoritarianism or autocracy? One or the other. So there's a name for it. If you have someone in the in the church or in the community you're working with um, who is an expert, you, you you can appropriately say that uh, um, you have to. I have to apologize here. I I have Parkinson's, and every now and then, every now and then, I come to a blank spot. Uh, so if you have a person who has who has the ability to do something, we would say that person, that person is what? Authoritative. You don't want to mix those words up because what I see happen, even in, in, in good good publications, we use the word authoritative as a negative, similar to authoritarian. Mm -hmm. So know, know what those are, know what those are and and uh, and and use them use them appropriately. Authority is permission. Power is the ability. Uh, if you if you exercise power without authority, you're an authoritarian. And see, that was Lucifer's sin. That was the sin that started all the pain that we experience now. Is Lucifer wanted to be in charge of everything? Second Thessalonians would, would, would suggest. That not only did he want to be like God, he wanted to be God. And as you said earlier, that um, Lucifer wanted to sit in the throne of God, but he was never able to do that. And we know that uh, that Satan, he was defeated by Jesus. And uh, for me, the amazing promise of Jesus is uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, when Jesus says that to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus would like to make us victorious and uh, would like to give what? us back this, uh, yes, this. Uh, what, what, it, what it showed, Bianca, is that, is and that's verse 21, not, not 20. 20 is where I stand at the door and knock. Oh, yes, thank you. 21, sorry. <laughs> um, but what, what's, what, what's really uh, uh, amazing about that is, is that Jesus is giving us the position that we, he promised us in Eden. Yes. Okay. So we were given the responsibility of governing this earth, this world. It's very clear very clear and so when when we when we when we have been successful in overcoming on this earth jesus says i will i will will give you a place to sit on my right hand so the throne that lucifer wanted and never got was given to us as a gift so we will sit on the throne and you don't sit on the throne for comfort. You sit on the throne because you have a responsibility in the ruler in the ruling process. Yes. Thank you. I have one last. Well, it's it's also a bit of a question. Um, having a look at the work environment, um, I've seen a lot. Like, I've had a look at the church manual of the Adventist Church, and I find it actually it is actually really forward thinking because back then. Uh, information need a lot of time to travel like if there was something a big decision that was made it would need to travel to the churches now we're at a time where information travels very very quickly and we expect it to manifest very quickly 
this takes away a little bit of the autonomy of the of the church which which with, with which the church originally was uh, equipped with um, now i see especially in work environment that we have flatter hierarchies that people are looked at as people in the workplace there's sort of a transformation going on um, from what i can pick up and um, i think sometimes the church is trailing a little bit behind culturally however i found there's a lot of Christian values that are regarded in this work environment. Having a look at the use of power and leadership in local churches, what would be some of the main points that you would uh, recommend our ch local churches to do in this current times where, you know, um, where a lot of things are different, where we, um, where not just the culture around us is changing, but also the churches are um, changing very quickly and at different speeds. I, I, I did a, a weekend, a spiritual leadership weekend at a church in, in Washington State here about four or five years ago. And I'm sitting on the front row waiting for, the, for, for, the, for them to be my turn to go up and, and, and present. And here comes this, this child, about 11 years old, maybe 12, comes, comes and sits beside me on the front row. And he has, he's well-dressed, has a nice little butch haircut. And, and, uh, and then he, he turns to me and he says, he says, is there anything you need? Now, this is just a child. Is there anything you need? And I said, like what? He said, well, would you like to have some water sitting on, on a table uh, up on the platform? I said, that'd be nice. He says, do you want to keep the pulpit or do you want to have an open stage? I'd like an open stage with the water sitting over to the right. So he asked me all these questions. Then he gets up and gets people to, to do it. And so here's a kid, 11 or 12 years old, that's in charge of me. He's in charge of the process. And he did a wonderful job that whole weekend. And when we got to the to Sunday and it was coming to an end, the conference was coming to an end. They asked me to to do some feedback about about how I thought the weekend went. I, he says, "What was what was the most positive thing you experienced in, in in our congregation?" I said, "The most positive experience that I had," and I told him about this kid. Because if you keep that that child appropriately positioned. As he, as, he, as he gets older, put him on the church board when he's 14 years old. Put somebody else there with him so you have two people on the board. If he's baptized, he, should, he has a right to be there. So give them meaningful responsibility. And, 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 and I said, my prediction is that this young man that, that served me so well, if he continues to be engaged by the church, not, not at his discretion, but he should be asked and called by the church to do certain things. That if I come back in five years, I would expect him to see him still healthy and functioning in the church. But the Seventh-day Adventist churches that, that I have been a part of almost always ignore the involvement of youth. We chuck them to the side, but, the, but we ought to be treating them as leaderships in process or leaders in process, I should say. Yeah, thank you, Eric, that's a good, good point. Thank you very much. Okay, let's share some takeaways. And then Dr. Patterson, I would ask you to speak again to our audience on the topic. So takeaways. Yeah, I'll say that. Uh, it really spoke to me when he was referring to open criticism of structures that, that are higher than my scope of influence, that that behavior can also be abuse of power in some sense. Yes. yes. That was great advice, yeah. My Thank you very much. My takeaway was to work within the context of our spiritual gift and to lead people with love into meaningful responsibilities. Mm -hmm.
For me, as you um, emphasize, Dr. Patterson, that that Jesus would like to um, give us back what we have lost in Eden. Um, he would like if if we could sit um, in His throne, and that was a, a very faith strengthening thought. And also that until then, um, the harvest which is in front of us is is very great, uh, but the workers are few. But uh, maybe let the Holy Spirit transform us, and and may that maybe be more and more workers. So so Jesus's great work um, could be done. And that Bible verse that you mentioned um, was also very um, uplifting for me. That uh, that we need to we have the privilege, this amazing privilege to to do this final harvest before Jesus's second coming. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. I think this season has been uh, excellent and I'm glad to join uh, discussion. Um, actually, this time I'm all even left with more questions than answers, but I think that's a reason to continue watching. And I think one of the main key takeaways is um, having this oxymoron of leadership and submission um, that you also receive meaning and, and that you know you are on the one hand you are serving but you're doing that out of your free will it it, it sounds sort of contradictive in our, our current society where we strive for freedom but um like from from normal social um you know um from the normal social framework that we are in and where we feel that we feel that we are sort of um put in a box by society but actually that in God, we can experience that um, freedom that of where we can receive the authority, how God meant it to be. And it looks very, it's, it sounds very contradictive, but um, I think this is something that has to be experienced where, um, where words wouldn't suffice to explain that. And I, I, I love the way you put it within the context of our spiritual gifts the way of involvement in the church. And um, yeah, thank you very much for those inspiring thoughts. My pleasure. Let me, let, me, let me add this to, to your comment, Eric. Good questions are much more valuable than good answers. Yes. <laughs> yes, I agree with that as well. Um, which is why we raise a lot of questions in this program. And uh, I think we're getting some really, really good direction. That's really helpful for our individual and, and communal life. I have three takeaways. I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, for me, this was a very rich discussion. So one of them is uh, I, I like the distinction between power as the ability to do something and the authority as a permission to, uh, to accomplish things in your power or in your ability. And you emphasized a wrong model uh, that you called autocrat. Uh, yeah, auth autocracy, uh, where people have um, uh, extend their authority, basically. But I think also we need to emphasize another wrong model, and we touched on that without emphasizing it too much, where uh, we need to also give authority to those who have the power or the ability to do yeah. things. So those two <laughs> models, uh, yeah, I think that's important to, to emphasize those. Yeah, it, it distinguishes us from the worldly model, our ability to exercise to exercise authority and give authority to people, give it yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. Puts us in puts us in company with the God of Heaven, and separates us from the behavior of the worldly model. Yeah, I think it was a, a lot said in a few concepts, so that was very helpful. Uh, I also liked very much when you shared about uh, our authority in Christ that is unlimited, because oftentimes we function based on our, our own authority and abilities, and that's very limited. And so we lack courage and faith. And so I think having that perspective that God, it's in God's power that we work and his authority that we work, that gives us a lot of courage and a lot of faith, and it really strengthens our relationship with God. And the last one is quite fascinating. I had never thought of it, but based on Reiner's initial question, um, I've learned today that a failed attempt, just even a failed attempt at power corruption can be extremely detrimental. 
And so we're not just talking about a power grab where it succeeds and we can see the effects of it being damaging to, to, uh, to a number of individuals and entities, but even just a failed attempt. So it's important to know the boundaries and to not even try because even just that could be very detrimental. That was completely new for me. So I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, Dr. Patterson, what are your final words for our viewers and our listeners about God is power in leadership? Let me just touch on two two items quickly. Um, number one, and I'm speaking now about the church I love, but I'm, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and tend to always be such. But I'm, I'm a little critical sometimes of some of the things that we do. Uh, and and your question earlier about the role of women and, and how, how that we should discern the right, right thing to do. If you're going to build a, a leadership model, build it on principles that are revealed prior to sin. Do not do mm -hmm. not pattern your leadership after successful leaders in Scripture. You do not want a biblical model because the biblical model contains people like Samson. So what you want is a God honoring model. Mm -hmm. So go to all the context where where, where the information is is pre fall. You follow me? We're pre-fall. Yeah. You're safe with the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus because he lived a pre-fall life. Okay. Go to the story of creation. Go to go to all of those contexts where where leadership is demonstrated outside of the influence of sin. It's very, very important. Yeah. Um with women, we have this issue. In the Adventist Church, if we, you know what a grab bag is? It's a game that used to be played in in country churches and, and stuff for for socials. You have a bag, and you have small gifts in the bag, and and you you have you have a contest so that whoever the winner is gets to reach in the bag and pull out a gift, not knowing what's not knowing what's in it. And so, so I want us to do that in terms of, in regard to, to the Garden of Eden and, and behaviors. We reach into the grab bag and we pull out diet. We open it up. Oh, I can accept this. O only eat certain fr fruits and vegetables and nuts and, and what have you. And, and, and so, so we embrace that. We embrace that. We, we, we in many cases, we reject the eating of flesh foods and what have you. So, so, so we accept the health thing that comes out of the Garden of Eden. Then we reach back into the bag and we pull out something else. We, we find there um, Sabbath. We, yeah, we accept the Sabbath that came in, in creation. So creation has all kinds of, of, of items that we pull out and accept on the basis of creation, not on the basis of the Ten Commandments, but on the basis of creation, a, a, a sample. Until we come to women. So we reach in the gra grab bag and we, we pull out marriage. And you open it up and it says, Adam and Eve were equal. And so we throw it back in the bag. We throw it back in the bag. We are fickle when it comes to what we learn from, from the Garden of Eden in a pre-fall context. We are fickle. We do not accept the idea that a woman should be equal to a man. But it's a biblical concept. It's supported by the writings of Ellen White. So we have it from, from a non-inspired non source and we have it from the inspired word of God. And so I think it's important for us to, to, to honestly look at these behaviors in the Garden of Eden and say, how much of this is, is, is am I accepting and how much am I rejecting? Okay. A heartfelt thank you to our special guests and to the student panelists for their thoughtful engagement. On behalf of our sponsor, the Adventist Theological Society, and on behalf of the Life with God team, I would like to also thank our viewers and our listeners for being here. 
We hope that you have learned some new and helpful insights that will transform you more into the likeness of God and empower you to become a better human being. As you can see, these conversations bring together young adults and scholars who have dedicated their lives to advancing our understanding of God, of the Bible, and of the complex human personhood. It is a unique opportunity for you to get to know these committed servant leaders and learn from them as they interact with students from around the world. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so with your presence, your comments, your prayers, and by sharing the program. If you're so inclined, you can also extend your financial support by donating to the Adventist Theological Society. To do so, go to www.atsjats.org slash resources and find the Donate Now button. Make sure you also subscribe to the Adventist Theological Society YouTube channel where you will find past and ongoing seasons. Thank you again, and I hope that you will join us next time as well.